Hello everyone, I'm Jacob O'Brant, and today we're going to talk about Biff. So I've described Biff as a self-hosted Firebase alternative, but what exactly does that mean, especially if you're not familiar with Firebase already? So first of all, Biff is just a web framework, right? So it has all the parts you need to build a fully functioning web, or web application, and those parts have been pre-assembled for you. Um, on top of that, there are some um, kind of fancy features that I have implemented, um, which have been inspired by Firebase, and we'll get to that later. But then the third thing is also that Biff scope includes deployment. So after you've developed your web app, we want Biff to also, well, I want Biff to also help you get it into production so people can use it. So we want the whole process to be nice and easy. Um, so the, the overall vision for Biff is that if you know you have some idea for a web application you want to make, Biff should help you get to the MVP stage as quickly and as easily as possible. Um, but on top of that, as you continue to grow your application, Biff should not get in the way. We want to keep it simple. Um, and later in the last part of the presentation, we'll dig into how exactly Biff is designed to facilitate that. Anyway, now that you have kind of a general idea of Biff, um, I want to give you some historical background. So I have been doing a lot of closure web development for the past two years, um, and I've had a lot of opportunities to make, make lots of different little web applications, um, which has allowed me to experiment with different things, try the different things out, find, you know, what do I like, what do I don't like, blah, blah, blah. Um, and by the beginning of, it, it was around the beginning of 2020, so almost a year ago, I had kind of bounced around all, all these different things and ended up on Firebase. So I was um, using Firebase for everything, authentication, backend, database, um, and found it to actually be quite nice. Um, it was very, especially like, you know, deployment and setting up, like it's just so easy to get an application started and I really appreciated the experience there. Um, however, it is, you know, a, a platform and, and if, you run into something, then you don't necessarily have a lot of leeway for changing the way Firebase works. And I found I was running into things. So it felt like this, like an 85% solution where, oh, it helped me a lot to you know get started and, and do a lot of things, but every once in a while, there's still just something that I run into and I have to kind of work around it. Um, so by that time, you know, I'd been using Firebase for, for a few months and I had figured out this idea of, of what I want my ideal web solution to look like. And so that ended up getting encoded into Biff. So I decided to move off of Firebase, move off of platforms, and just use plain, boring VMs and kind of set everything up myself. And so here we are with Biff. Um, and so Biff is intended to take as much of that work as possible and make it reusable. So a, a critical part is that with Biff, I'm not trying to make this you know, big, fancy, complete framework that solves every problem you're going to run into. All I'm trying to do is just make it so the work I've already done on my own applications is reusable. So, if you want to start using Biff, um, this is taken from the getting started section of the documentation. And so all you have to do to get started is run this single shell command. And that will download the latest version of Biff and then run a little setup wizard thing to make a new project on your computer. And the main thing you have to decide is what project type you want. So Biff has two project types. So there's a single page application, and this includes ClojureScript, React, and all the fancy, you know, Firebase -y features. Um, and so this is kind of a full Biff experience. Um, that being said, not every application needs to be a complicated single page application. So we also have a multi-page application template and this is actually what my startup is using currently. Um, and so this just uses plain old server side rendering. So no React, no ClojureScript or anything. Um, and there are a couple other questions we answered, but once you get through the, the setup wizard, um, it'll give you some instructions for running the application in development. And so once you start it in development and go to it, this is what it will look like. Um, so 
the demo application is pretty simple, but it also includes pretty much all the main features of Biff. So it's a very good like tour of Biff to figure out you know what features does it have and how do you use those features and experiment, but then also be able to then grow from there and change it into whatever web application you're actually trying to make. So let's just go through some of these and I'll describe Biff's features, um, some of them anyway. So first of all, you know, we got authentication. So you can sign in, you can sign out, pretty simple. It works via email link. Um, so there's no password, you just type in your email address, hit send, well, hit sign in, and then you get an email and you click on the link um, and then you sign in, boom. Um, now past that, under here, we have a bunch of read and write stuff um, and so this first box, foo, so you got a text box, you can type some stuff in, you can click update, and when you click that button, it will set the foo attribute on a certain document to the value that you typed in here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but it does this in a somewhat fancy way, so it uses what I call a BIF transaction. Um, and the way this works, um, it's very similar to what Firebase does. So in Biff, you can actually submit transactions and queries directly from the front end. So you don't have to set up a custom endpoint to handle these kinds of things, to handle current operations. What you do have to do is you have to define a set of authorization rules on the back end. So it's, for the most part, this is a list of functions and they kind of define, you know, what is, what kind of data is allowed to be written to the database and, and who is allowed to write it and who's allowed to read it, those kinds of things. But once you set up all those rules, then you can submit any transaction from the front end that you want and Biff will check it against the rules for you to see if it passes or not. Um, and so it's very handy for, you know, kind of tedious CRUD operations that normally you'd have to, you know, set up a bunch of repetitive stuff. You can just eliminate all that boilerplate. Um, and it's quite nice. Now, this next section here demonstrates a different way to write information because you can also kind of go the traditional route um, and use a custom event handler instead. Or, I mean, you could also use a HTTP endpoint. Um, but this sets up a WebSocket connection for you anyway, so might as well use that. But anyway, so the way this, this does the same thing, you know, you click the button and it send, sets the bar attribute on some other document. Um, and it does that by triggering a, a WebSocket event, and then on the back end, you take the data and you you authorize it. You know, you check who is this user who submitted this data, and then you craft the transaction and submit it to Crux, which is the database that Biff uses. Um, so anyway, so the demo app demonstrates both ways, and so you can look at how that is done. Now, the last um, main feature that the example app demonstrates is query subscriptions. And this, this is kind of Firebase's like original big feature. So as I mentioned a second ago, you can submit queries directly from the front end, um, but on top of that, Biff will notify you whenever the results of those queries change. So here we've got two different users who have signed into this Biff application. Um, and so they have subscribed to all the messages that are sent. So whenever someone types, oops, whenever someone types a message and hits send, that will pop up immediately for everyone. Um, and this feature is actually kind, it was one of the big impetuses for um, creating Biff in the first place, because I was using Firebase, and then one day I had an epiphany, and I realized how I could re-implement Firebase's query subscription feature, but do it in Biff in a way that is efficient. <coughs> um, and so it doesn't, you know, as your app scales and things, you're not going to hit a wall, right? Um, the trade-off of this is that the queries you can subscribe to are somewhat limited. Um, they have about the same power that Firebase queries have, but they're not as powerful as like SQL or data log or anything. Um, in practice, so they're still quite handy and useful. So. Um, 
once you have you know checked out the demo application a little bit it has some pointers for you know files in your project that are good starting points so you can look through the files and, and i've put a lot of encode documentation um so you can explore and see how things work but the code also has links to the reference documentation and that's what this is <laughs> So you can kind of go back and forth between you know experimenting with the code hands on and then reading uh, this page to get a deeper understanding of how everything is working. Um, and once you have a web application set up and you want to try deploying it, we have a section right here at the end for doing that. So the first time you deploy, there are a number of steps you'll have to go through. Like, for example, you have to set up a DigitalOcean account. Um, again, if you want to use something other than DigitalOcean, that's not too hard. Um, however, for the sake of the documentation, I just assume you're using DigitalOcean. Um, so you have to set that up and, and you know set some config like your DigitalOcean API key, and there are uh, you know a short list of other things you'll have to do. But once you go through all that the first time, deploying is exactly two steps. You push your code to Git, and then you run this command, and this command will execute some stuff on your server which will download the latest commit from your Git repository um, and then run that. And this can, the whole process takes about like 30 to 60 seconds to run. And it can all be done on a $5 DigitalOcean droplet. So now you have an idea of you know, what Biff is, what does it do, how can you use it? So I wanna dig into this question of how do we make sure that Biff doesn't get in your way as your application grows? Because that's kind of the hard thing about frameworks, right? Because um, frameworks, in my opinion, are not inherently bad. They're just extremely hard to get right. Um, you know, to contrast them to libraries. So libraries are easier to keep simple because they're all, you know, they're separated from each other. So they naturally stay untangled. The, downside is that now the work of putting those libraries together falls on you. Um, frameworks, on the other hand, you know, we take all those parts, the little parts, and we put them together. Um, and so there's more opportunity to make things easy. But now the downside is it's kind of like the same problem with, you know, Apple iPod headphones before we had AirPods, right? Like imagine you have a nice untangled pair, pair of headphones and you put them in your pocket and they just magically become this tangled ball of spaghetti. Like you don't even do anything, it just happens. And code is the same way. So you make a framework and you're not trying to make it complicated. It just happens like without you even noticing. <laughs> and so the big question is how can you make a framework simple? How can you prevent it from getting tangled so that you can have the best of both worlds, simple and easy? Um, and I think a big part of the answer is decomposability. When you're making a framework, you need to think about not just how are you going to put it together, but you have to think about how are you going to take it apart? Because sooner or later, someone is going to try to do something that you didn't think of. Um, and when that happens, either they will be able to take it apart and do what they need to do, or they will have to fork the framework. And if they fork it, that is a failure. So we want to prevent that from happening. And so the question is, how do we make sure that Biff is easy to take apart without forking? Um, and so we're going to dive into the code a little bit so you can understand how that works. Um, so here's an example application. Um, we've got a main function. So this is what we'll run when your application starts. And the main thing we do is we call this Biff start system function. So this is the main entry point for Biff. Um, <laughs> and so this function takes two things. So first of all, it takes a system map. And this mainly contains um, the rest of the code in your application. So we've got HTTP routes, and we have the authorization rules that we were just talking about a minute ago. And the second thing we pass in is a list of components. So a component is a function. Um, and let me, let's go to this next slide. Okay, so um, yeah, so we, here's the implementation of start system. 
So again, we pass in that system map and we pass in a list of components. And these are the default components that we pass in. And each component is a function. We take the system map, we pass it to the component, and then that modified map gets passed down to the next function. So each component function takes the map and you know, does something to it um, and passes it to the next one, kind of like ring middleware. Like if you imagine a ring request, you're passing it through this list of functions before you get to the handler. It's conceptually, you know, kind of like that, just threading a value through a bunch of functions. Um, but once we have the final system map, we stick it in this atom so you can get to it if you need. Um, and we also have this refresh function, which handles some things for Apple driven development. So to give you an idea of what a particular component function looks like, this is the one to start the web server. So again, we pass a map. And since all of our configuration is in a single map, we need to use namespaced keys so that they don't collide. Um, so we get the config that's relevant for this component and we use it to start a Jetty server um, and we return the system map and we include a function that will clean up any resources that we started. Um, and so to answer the original question of how do you take Biff apart, the answer is you just pass in a different list of components. It's just functional composition, or in this case, functional decomposition. All right, so you can add more, you can add your own components, you can take some components out, you can modify some components that we provide for you, whatever you wanna do. Um, and so that is Biff's main method of decomposability. However, that alone does not guarantee that BIF will actually be simple because the components still have to communicate with each other. Um, and so there's still an opportunity for them to become tangled. So in my opinion, um, on top of that, I think you have to have people who actually use the framework and who try to take it apart. Because when people try to take it apart, they will naturally run into the parts that are complicated. And then once those parts are identified, they can be fixed. And so I think it's to have a framework that is simple, I think it's those two things, a focus on decomposability and constant vigilance to actually make sure it really is simple. Um, and so BIF is basically an experiment to find out, you know, is that gonna work? Um, and I actually think Clojure is the perfect language to have a framework like this because the community understands simplicity and it values simplicity. So I hope you all have enjoyed this as much as I have. And I also hope if you have an idea for some web application you want to make that Biff can help that happen. Bye-bye.